The year is 2023, and big things are happening on planet Kerbin. In sports news, the Meanie Greenies have won their first Kerbal Curveball National Championship. Kerbologist Dr. Emmett Kerman III just won the Cobel Prize for his work unlocking the secrets of Kerbal skin pigmentation. And the Upward Space Program, the premier Kerbal Aerospace Agency, which would one day chart the vast unknown of space, is about to begin making history. After years of applying for grants, pitching plans to potential investors, and running their lemonade stand, the Upward Space Program has finally been fully funded and moved into their shiny new space center. Of course, they have no idea what they're doing, but that has never stopped Kerbal kind before. So the Kerbonauts begin training, and the engineers begin engineering, determined to succeed through power of will and unlimited budget. Things are looking up for these Kerbals, and as they say in the Upward Space Program, if you're going up, you're going right. Despite appearances, the Upward Space Program was starting from square one. They had basically ordered an entire space center off Kermazon, and now needed to understand how to use it all. The early days of the program, those were fun. We knew nothing, so every day we learned something new. So much testing, and building, and figuring things out. It was an exciting time for us. We had so much to learn. And learn they did, through trial and error. They learned how their rockets worked. They learned how to accidentally launch a rocket. Whoops. Then they learned how to intentionally launch a rocket. Success. And of course, they learned that things that go up, generally, come back down. And things that come down, usually go boom. So they learned how to preserve a payload by returning it safely to the ground with parachutes. Ahem. <clears throat> they learned how to preserve a payload by returning it safely to the ground with parachutes. There we go. They learned the importance of symmetry. Hmm. They learned the importance of proper staging. The snacks landed just fine, by the way. Every test and every launch, they learned something new until finally the Upward Space Program was ready for its first milestone, launching a rocket with a Kerbal on board. Jebediah Kerman, the famed pilot and the face of the Upward Space Program, volunteered to fly the first manned rocket. It was a simple craft with a simple mission, take Jebediah up and bring him back down safely. A hush fell over the entire space center as the all clear was given and the countdown began. The rocket was away. Jebediah Kerman was being vaulted into the sky by the power of a thousand Kerbal-sized bonfires. The thrust only lasted a few seconds, but Jebediah's craft continued to climb, coasting higher into the atmosphere. Past 5,000 meters, past 10,000 meters, Jeb would reach just over 20,000 meters. From this height, Jeb could see the stars and the moon. He could see the tiny space center below. He could see the curvature of the planet itself. Take that, Flat Kerbin Society. He wasn't even halfway through the atmosphere, but Jeb felt like space was at his fingertips. At peak altitude, Jebediah fired his chute and began the slow fall back to the ground. All eyes were on the craft as it descended. Watching the capsule, uh, you know, come down, I remember thinking, if he dies, it's over. You know, the whole program is over. It'd be in the news for a month, there would be an investigation, you know, we could go to jail. 
The investors would pull out. The whole thing goes down the drain if he dies. Oh, and Jeff, too. I mean, I was most concerned for, you know, for his safety. Obviously. Everyone held their breath as the pod got closer, waiting to see the chute open and stop Jeb's freefall. Watching. Waiting. Praying. Wait, what? What happened? Where'd it go? Where's the chute? Where is it? What just... Oh no! No, no! No, 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 no! Every eye was on Jeb, waiting for his chutes to stop his descent. Suddenly, the drogue chutes opened. These auxiliary parachutes, which were definitely part of the original design, are high-altitude, low-drag chutes intended to slow the craft to a safe speed before the main chute deploys. And as the big yellow chute opened, the sight erupted in cheers of celebration. The capsule touched down safely, with a slight bump, and the Upward Space Program celebrated the success of their first manned mission. The Kerbals quickly began on their next goal, reaching space. Jeb's simple rocket had gotten him to 20,000 meters, but they needed to reach 70,000 meters to be considered in space. Pilot Valentina Kerman volunteered for the next mission, and she offered a simple solution. Use a bigger booster. She also asked the engineers to spruce it up a little and add some paint trim. The rocket was ready, and so was the pilot. Valentina Kerman was a stunt pilot and notoriously brave. On launch morning, when asked if she felt afraid, she said, if it doesn't work, it won't not work for long, and then I'll be dead. So what's there to be afraid of? Valentina's words inspired fearlessness in the crew that day and became a common saying within the program. Undaunted by the possibility of catastrophic failure, Valentina boarded the rocket and awaited the countdown. Lift off! Faster and more powerful than the last, the rocket shot into the sky. The booster hadn't even finished firing as the rocket passed 20,000 meters. As Valentina coasted higher and higher through the atmosphere, she checked her instruments. Her projected maximum elevation was over 100,000 meters. The world below looked so small, the clouds like poorly drawn chalk on pavement, the stars close enough to touch. Valentina Kerman was in space. Valentina separated the booster from the capsule as she began the long descent back to Kerbin. Everything was going according to plan, except that the craft was no longer above the space center and was now coming down over the mountains to the west the great minds of the Upward Space Program quickly realized Valentina's journey had been sufficiently long for the planet to actually rotate beneath her. Certainly something to consider for future missions, but for now, it is what it is. As long as the capsule didn't start rolling down a mountainside, everything would be fine. And as Valentina touched down, she got to experience one of Kerbin's more interesting features. Bizarre floating grass, because apparently that's a thing. Valentina climbed out of her pod. She had landed off course, and who knew when the crew back at the space center would arrange a pickup, so Valentina started the long walk home. But she didn't mind. Nothing was going to ruin her day now. Valentina Kerman had gone to space and back. Having broken through the atmosphere, the Kerbals now tackled a harder challenge, reaching space and staying there. To achieve the orbit, we knew we had to move past the boosters. We needed controlled thrusters. We needed the liquid fuel, the methane and the oxidizer. We needed more than one stage rocket. We needed articulate wings to turn it. And we wanted to test all these things to do one piece at a time. But Jeb, he said, no, no. He just wanted to go. 
he kept saying, we will do it live, we will do it live. So, he did it live. The fresh white and blue paint couldn't hide the fact that Jebediah was basically sitting on top of a giant, unlit fart. A humorous image that he never quite lived down. The rocket was off the pad, boosters and thruster firing together. But as soon as Jeb had sufficient speed and altitude, he tipped the craft to the east and cut the main thruster, letting the boosters carry the craft through the lower atmosphere. As the boosters ran out, Jeb refired the thruster and jettisoned the boosters. Cutting the dead weight would be crucial to reaching a stable orbit. Everything was going to plan. Jeb monitored his instruments, and as his max elevation reached 80,000 meters, he cut his engine and coasted toward it. Ground control confirmed his peak elevation, the apoapsis, was 81,000 meters. But Jeb would have to make a stable orbit or else he'd come crashing back down. Now was the waiting game. Jeb was still going up, but he needed to begin his circularization burn this side of the apoapsis or he would begin descending. He didn't seem worried about it though. At T minus 30 seconds to apoapsis, Jeb fired his thruster again. The first stage depleted, all part of the plan, and Jeb separated from it and fired his smaller second stage thruster. This thruster would have been basically useless inside the atmosphere, but was much more effective for small craft here in the vacuum of space. As Jeb pushed forward, the ground crew in the tracking station watched his projected trajectory circularize around the planet until finally, a complete circle. And Jeb had done it. His craft was in a stable orbit around Kerbin. His apoapsis, the highest point in his trajectory, and his periapsis, the lowest point, were both outside the atmosphere, a stable orbit. Jeb took in the view. On one side, the sights and geography of Kerbin passing by below him. On the other side, the vast expanse of space, with unknown wonders just waiting to be discovered. And this first crucial step would get them there. Jeb's craft did nearly one complete orbit around Kerbin. As he approached the space center from the west, Jeb turned the craft around to begin a re-entry burn. The plan was to splash down his capsule in the oceans west of the space center. Then ground control changed their mind and decided a landing would be better, so Jeb burned a little more to touch down in the desert. As the craft re-entered the atmosphere, it was time for Jeb to jettison the remaining fuel and engine. The engineers were concerned about the pod overheating as it cut into the air, so they had installed a heat shield to its underside. And for the first time, the space center did not have eyes on a returning capsule, so Jeb and ground control remained in contact the entire descent. The air resistance didn't overheat the pod, but it did adjust the craft's course and leave Jeb splashing down in the oceans after all. The return went perfectly, and Jeb's pod was soon bobbing in the ocean, where he had to wait for rescue because there was no way he was swimming to shore. But still, a safe return. The Upward Space Program had much to celebrate, and this was only the beginning. These early tests and milestones paved the way for the reality-shattering exploration the program would come to be known for. There's still more to this story, and the best is yet to come. Upward and onward, Kerbals. Hey everyone, Lieutenant Dan here. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. And if you haven't already seen the Planet Crafter or Long Dark videos, I would definitely recommend those. I hope you stick around and check out the other fun stuff happening here at Lieutenant Dan Productions. You guys have a fantastic day.